Rouse's is proud of the creativity and the unparalleled entertainment in New Orleans and honored to highlight it with their sponsorship of Steppin' Out on WYES. Scott Laborde and welcome to Steppin' Out with updates from the local restaurant, arts, and entertainment scenes. Joining me, Poppy Tooker, host of Louisiana Eats on WWNO Radio from the Yes Cafe. Hello, Miss Hello, Poppy. Hello, Peggy. <laughs> Good to see you. International opera star and director, actor Anthony Latura, returning to his hometown to direct a play at the Jefferson Performing Arts Society. Welcome back, Anthony. It's nice to see you. Nice to be home, Peggy. It's Nice to be here with you. <laughs> Ditto, babe. Doug McCash, who covers the arts and culture scenes for the Times Picayune, New Orleans Advocate. Hello, Mr. Doug. Hi. Hey, and Alan Smason of theatercriticism.com and the Crescent City Jewish News. Howdy, Alan. Hey, I forgot my matzo tie. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks anyway. <laughs> Poppy, the return of a truly oldie but goodie. Oldie but goodie, a New Orleans classic. And you know, Peggy, I'm just going to tell you the truth about my experiences of the last couple of years and my experience this week. You know, in New Orleans, there's lots of places to get beignets now. There's Cafe Beignet down in the quarter. They're even serving Rice Kella, you know, right there by Pat O'Brien's. And the New Orleans hamburger and seafood people have a perfectly good beignet uptown off St. Charles Avenue at their beignet spot. But it's been hard for a New Orleanian to get that beignet they've been longing for ever since Morning Call at City Park closed. Now, I would often still go to City Park, but I must admit it got to a point where I was only going for a cup of coffee because sometimes the beignets were crunchy. Sometimes the beignets were, well, let me show you a real beignet. This is the happiest day of my life in recent times. This is the new morning call that just opened up earlier this week on the corner of City Park Avenue and Canal Boulevard. It is the most beautiful space inside where you can see out over the cemeteries. Now, let me show you a beignet that is a beignet that is a beignet. You take a bite and inside you discover oh, it's light, it's airy, it's perfect. And that's what you're going to have at morning call, along with truly the best cup of cafe au lait that you can get in this city, where they're pouring the coffee and the hot milk simultaneously from the two pitchers. It's going to feel like home on the inside, and even better, you're going to be greeted by so many of the wait staff that took care of you, perhaps at City Park, Definitely the longtime waitresses from Lakeside, they are right there on Canal Boulevard. There's outdoor seating, there's indoor seating. It's beautiful, don't miss it. Oh, and for those who are worried about the parking spots, there's 28 parking spots in total behind that building, and there's lots of parking on Canal Boulevard. That is a question I was just about to ask you, so thank you, yes, that was the concern. And to be able to see the streetcars. Oh, to think, I'm so happy that tourists will be able to have that authentic, real New Orleans experience and ride the streetcar too. How perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh, oh, now, Anthony, my goodness. Okay, you lived, of course, in New Jersey, and you were at the Met for so long, but you're a New Orleans guy. Yes. And a third ward guy. You went to Sacred Heart, then you went over to Holy Cross. Right. But I remember when you at Loyola and then Tulane, all those summer lyric shows, yeah. and uh, you really uh, got your start here from some wonderful teachers, didn't you? Absolutely. Um, Actually, the first theater teacher I had was at Sacred Heart. When I was a little boy, we did the 
the, the high school did a play called uh, uh, The Little Choir Boy Who Couldn't Sing, and that turned out to be me, and I prayed, <laughs> and Sister Dorothy, S-N-D, taught me how to read the, the prayer and to deliver the lines, and she was my first teacher. Oh, wonderful. And then you make your operatic debut with Norman Tragel at 11? Right, Norman Tragel, uh, <laughs> right, that was with the New Orleans Opera. Norman Tragel, uh, Arthur Cosenza's wife, Marietta Muse, uh, it was when Renato Cellini was still alive as the music director of uh, New Orleans Opera. Uh, a gentleman called Christopher West from, uh, from the uh, stage staff, stage directorial staff at New York City Opera, and the cast of both New York City Opera singers and uh, Metropolitan Opera singers, later on which I became <laughs> colleagues with and worked with wow. as, an, as an adult. Incredible. Now, when did you move up to New York? We moved in 1979, uh -huh. and then uh, I went, uh, made my uh, sort of East Coast debut with uh, uh, Baltimore Lyric, Lyric Opera of Baltimore, mm -hmm. and that sort of became my second opera home. And then uh, in 1981, I was hired uh, to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. In 82, I made my debut, uh -huh. sort of a wonderful night. It was with De Rosen Cavalier, with uh, Kiri Takanova, oh. Tatiana Troianos, uh, <laughs> Judith, <laughs> Judith Blagan, uh, Luciano Pavarotti, uh -huh. and I was the second act major domo. Okay. Now, compromario, that's a new word for me. Oh, okay. But explain what, what that was, because that's what you were at the, at the Met. Yeah, uh, the second banana. <laughs> I used to tell my colleagues, it's a tenor, of I said, course. you uh -huh. are, yes, I said, you guys are the leading tenors, and I'm the following tenor. <laughs> but what happened with that is that it, uh, the, in America, the Compre Mario started to expand itself because we had more and more singing actors. So I sort of uh, tried to get that a lot of acting into the, dr the drama that the composer has mm -hmm. written. So musically, there was a lot of drama. So, so I thought, well, with my background from, Holy, from uh, uh, Loyola with mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Cosenza, my own teacher, Charlie Paddock, and then with uh, the work of my mentor, Frank Monachino at Tulane, wow. we did... Uh, it all started to work pretty well. Well, let's fast forward, of course, 27 years at the Met, but many of you and many of us remember, of course, that uh, you were the second banana on Boardwalk Empire. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, With isn't Steve that Buscemi, yes. Look, there you uh, are. There he is. Wow. Look at that fella. True. That yeah. had to be so much fun. And it dark, was, it but was, fun, huh? It was <laughs> absolutely thrilling. I can't tell you how thrilling it was. It's, it was as thrilling as. Uh, almost as exciting as it was when my son was born. Otherwise, that it was uh, that thrilling. <laughs> I, uh, people said, well, you have prepared your whole life from 10 years old uh, to, uh, in opera, doing the second banana, to do Boardwalk Empire. And I said, I don't know. All I know is I was taught a great lesson by a good, uh, 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 one of the great writers that wrote for me, and he said, you're playing for that camera, not 4,000 people. So I honed everything down so to be nice and tight mm -hmm. so that none of my performance ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> well, that's good news. <laughs> well, we're going to come back to you in just a Great. minute and talk about the, the show that you're directing. But over to Doug. And Doug, I cannot believe we're still talking about Mardi Gras, but for a good reason. That's it. Um, if you love the uh, house float craze that happened during Carnival 2021, get down to the Contemporary Arts Center on Camp Street for one last look. Uh, part of that story was that Carolyn Thomas and the crew of Red Beans got together to form a charity to benefit Mardi Gras um, float artists whose jobs were threatened because the parades were canceled. Uh, they ended up raising $330,000 to hire 48 of those artists to decorate 23 houses. Um, now those decorations are up for auction in the garage behind the Contemporary Art Center, and it's a wonderful exhibit to walk through. 
Um, if you're so inclined, you could buy the Dr. John Night Tripper skull for three thousand dollars. Are you? That's where the bidding begins. You could buy the statue of Pete Fountain for two thousand five hundred, or an enormous egret for a thousand. And there are there are many things there that are uh, less expensive, of course. Uh, the money goes to benefit Second Line Parade participants and the Contemporary Art Center. Uh, the show was going to end this weekend, but uh, they've extended it to April 11, and uh, and this is one not to miss. You'll get a kick out of it. Yes, and um, you can bid, and um, it, yeah, there's some things that are much more, or three thousand dollars, as you said. So um, I've I've got my hopes up for a few, mm -hmm. quite a few of those things, <laughs> but I'm um, very exciting. All right, thank you so much, Doug. Of and over to Alan. Well, you know, uh, as Rivertown Theaters for the Performing Arts has been doing a number of of shows geared towards kids, it's time for us older adults, as it were, uh, to be prepared to return to the theater. After all, for many of us who love musical theater, it's a hard habit to break. Speaking of habits, they're getting ready to bring out a comedic chestnut that we all know and love. It's nonsense, of course. The musical about the Little Sisters of Hoboken, directed by Gary Rucker. The singing cast will have face shields and the audience will be socially distanced. The cast includes Lori Reiningel, uh, Christina Early, Chelsea uh, Gidden, uh, Carrie Black, and of course, newcomer uh, uh, Jordan Lawrence. And we're going to talk more about Jordan later. Uh, meanwhile, the latest production from George Street Playhouse is now streaming, Peggy on Demand. This time it's Malik Pancholi, who's featured, of course, in the past in 30 Rock and Weeds. Uh, he's channeling Sam Ash, a struggling actor and a reservationist at a trendy New York City restaurant. Pancholi channels fully 42 characters from would be customers to co workers of the restaurant that specializes, specializes in molecular gastronomy with menu <laughs> items like lavender foam and sacks of liquid chicken. The characters are really over the top, but this play, which was written by Becky Mode, is a fabulous performance for one man able to be able to use his acting skills to channel those accents and those speech patterns. So you want to check that out. It's really worth your while. Uh, you can read my entire uh, review of this on theatercriticism.com if you want to check it out. It is a $33 show. Meanwhile, uh, how about taking a path down memory lane? This is uh, an incredible gathering. Uh, where do you get Sandy Duncan of Peter Pan, uh, Dee Dee Cohn, Frenchie from Greece, Donnie Mose, Ralph Mal from Happy Days, and Adrian Zemed from T.J. Hooker all together again? It's a film production of a piece they did called Middletown by Dan Clancy, which was shot back in February of last year in Marietta, Georgia. Middletown's the story of two baby boomer couples who really come together as young parents raising their daughters and who grow old together while maintaining their friendships through four decades. Along the way, they learn about the problems confronting them, uh, indeed, as they uh, confront issues such as infidelity and, of course, death. It's a reading, and the actors are on book, but they really do a good job, and the piece does more than a passing uh, resemblance to uh, our town. You'll enjoy it. It's got a, its share of comedy and pathos. It's $25 uh, per household and really worth uh, checking out, again, on demand for $25 now through the weekend. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot to be said for this uh, show, so check it out, Peggy. It's... it's uh, uh, Overture.plus, Patron, G4 Productions to okay. get to. Okay, thank you, Alan. And Poppy, you kind of sort of went across the pond for your next item. I sort of <laughs> went across the pond. And, you know, so many of us, we're dying to do a little traveling. Well, I've got a way that you can travel a very short distance and feel as though you've gone to England. And I'm telling you, Peggy, those people, the lovely Jan and Tim Landtrip from the English Tea Room over in Covington. I had the most incredible experience sitting down with the two of them this week. What fascinating characters they are. The whole time we spent together will end up on an episode of Louisiana Eats before too long. But let me tell you about some of the things I learned. You know, they have over 200 different kinds of teas on their menu. And see, Jan, is a compound pharmacist by trade. Mm. And so she knows more than you can imagine about putting flavors together and about the health benefits of teas. Now that cup of tea you saw just a moment ago, that was something that is called 
Pu Air, and it is a Chinese tea that is fermented. I never tasted anything like it. I'm hooked. And here is an example of their lovely high tea offering. They've got some of the best scones I've ever tasted. They have multiple varieties of scones every day, and their scones are so delicious that Sir Anthony Hopkins himself once shipped 350 of them with him on his private plane for a little event in Los Angeles. Wow. So it's the most amazing experience. It's right there in Covington. It barely takes a little over 30 minutes to get there. They're open every day but Sundays. So have a little trip to England and just cross the causeway. <laughs> Thank you, Poppy. <laughs> Sounds great. And Anthony, we are crossing over to Airline Drive. Now, should, we should first point out that at Comedy of Tenors, there's no singing. So how's that? <laughs> well, it, it's not an opera, but it's about opera tenors. And you may have thought that opera tenors are not funny. Well, they really are. <laughs> Now, there are excerpts. Uh, with the rights comes uh, an excerpt from uh, the, the uh, Libiamo, from Traviata, la, from La Traviata, for which the tenors sing. And we have added several clips of, uh, of singing. Mm -hmm. So you will hear singing well, the, okay. without the clips, but it's... Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a wonderful show. It is filled with, uh, uh, with hijinks, truly, and some sla slapstick, and uh, it's a little bit of everything. Now, this was the sequel to Lend Me a Tenor. That is correct. Okay. He, yeah. uh, to the best, Ken Ludwig. Uh, uh, Lend Me a Tenor was on Broadway, but uh, Comedy of Tenors didn't make it to Broadway. Mm -hmm. However, it, you don't have to see Lend me a tenor. It stands, this stands so strong on itself. Mm -hmm. We have a great cast, a spectacular crew, and when you walk into the theater on those nights that you have up on the, uh, on the screen, uh, you will thoroughly be entertained, you will thoroughly laugh, and uh, have truly a good time. I'm directing it. And I'm having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much fun. And of course, JPAS, um, but the facility itself, oh. that, that center, it, you know, is so conducive. And the, um, the, the, uh, the acoustics are fine oh, for it, too. So great fun. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that uh, Mr. Asaf decided to, to tap you to bring you home for a little while. So am I. Maestro yeah. Asaf, this is uh, my first venture back here in New Orleans to direct. Yeah. Well, and I'm very happy that uh, Maestro uh, Asaf we're good friends for a long time, and uh -huh. so this is a play I think you can direct, you should direct, so there I you said, are. sure, let's <laughs> okay. come. Well, thank you so much, and we're so glad to see you. Thank and you. Uh, artist Lynn Emery's sculptures were literally and figuratively moving. She passed away recently, but her work locally and internationally are a constant reminder of her genius. Doug will share his own reflections, but first, here's a WYES profile. Lynn Emery is one of the, uh, the great artists from New Orleans, um, has been a presence on the art scene in New Orleans since the 1950s, so more than a half a century. One of the great modernists in town. Born in New York in 1926, Emery is a sculptor whose art is displayed around the world. She learned to do figurative work in Paris. When I came back to the United States, I was able to make my living doing saints' figures for churches all over the country. I eventually got much more interested in the structure than the cover, so that got me to work abstractly and also to want to learn to weld. Emery's skill set and subject matter evolved. She has become one of the foremost creators of kinetic sculpture, which is essentially sculpture that physically moves. It's very simple to make things actually move. Just balance them correctly and let air or water or something move them. These natural elements and forms, such as leaves, branches, and flowers, inspire Emery, whose sculptures are in numerous public spaces around New Orleans. There are very few artists who have had the, the span 
of a career that she's had. There are very few artists who have had the important commissions that she's had and have such a recognizable signature style. Lynn Emery continues to create and design. Her advice for younger artists is straightforward. I always tell them to get technical experience. Just keep doing it. Lynn Emery's extraordinary achievements have distinguished her as an internationally acclaimed artist, all the while staying rooted in New Orleans. And special thanks to producer Matt Martinez for this feature. Doug, a PS to this, your thoughts? Oh my goodness, watching uh, Lynn passed away when she was 94. And imagine the span. Uh, she was born in 1926 when Calvin Coolidge was president. And she came of age in the 1950s when sculpture, when art, uh, particularly metal sculpture, was a man's game. Um, with Ida Kohlmeier back in the 70s and the 80s, she became a guide for any young woman uh, wanting to enter the career. And I, I want to uh, leave you with one thought. From, from here on out, when you look at a Lynn Emery sculpture, Think of this paradox. Um, her work abstracted nature. You, you, you can pick that right up. Um, but without ever being particularly naturalistic. Notice that the stainless steel is always stainless steel. The copper pipe is always copper pipe. She didn't disguise anything. It's this marvelous paradox between um, what the art suggests and what the art is. And, and that'll live forever. It certainly will. Thank you so much, Doug. And back over to Alan. Well, earlier, Peggy, uh, I had mentioned that uh, Jordan Lawrence was going to be uh, uh, featured in Nonsense. Well, she's going to be my guest. She's playing Sister Amnesia in Nonsense, and she's going to be my guest on the... Uh, uh, show tomorrow night of NOLA Theater Talk. You can see her here in a performance of Spelling Bee. She's a fascinating actor and singer. She's going to talk about her journey to the stage, uh, but also her job, her day job, as the cantorial soloist, maybe that's a night job, uh, at Congregation <laughs> Gates of Prayer in Metairie. You can also read the story in the uh, Crescent City Jewish News, but again, NOLA Theater Talk on the Theater Folk Facebook group, the Facebook page for theater criticism, and my own YouTube channel. And also, I wanted to remind everybody that Paradise Blue, uh, headed up by uh, the remarkable Blair Underwood, uh, is going to be uh, featured uh, now uh, and, and forever on Audible. Uh, this particular piece is part of the Williamstown Theater Festival and their joint production with Audible. It's Dominique Morisot's Paradise Blue, a dark tale set in a fictional setting after the World War II era when the bebop jazz was all the buzz. As with all of their uh, productions' exceptional high values, the performances are all exceptional. Of course, it is an audio production. Morriso, who wrote the book for Ain't Too Proud to Beg, uh, uh, is a uh, writer who writes really well for the black experience and is one of America's leading playwrights. And uh, she has a, a show that's getting ready to go on Broadway once we open back up again. So I uh, hope you get a chance to see this out as well. Paradise Blue by Dominique Morriso. And uh, their latest piece, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, wish you were here, takes place in the Iranian Revolution. Uh, this is by Sanaz Tusi, and it takes place 14 years after that, all the way up there. Uh, it begins streaming actually today, so you get to see uh, or uh, at least listen to uh, uh, two uh, uh, pieces. One is a world premiere. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Peggy, on the Seth Rudetsky's concert series this week, he's going to be working with Matt Doyle, who was recently in the Broadway uh, performances of uh, the cross-gender production of Company. Uh, he's been on Broadway in the Book of, of Mormon as Elder Price. You get to see Matt Doyle uh, for $25, or if you want to see the rehearsal time ahead of time as a VIP, that's this Sunday at 2 o'clock with a repeat performance uh, that's not live uh, at 7 p.m. Thank you so much. Now time for our picks of the week. Poppy. Well, we already planned a trip to England, so <laughs> now John Foles wants to take us to Paris. On Wednesday, April the 14th, he's going to be cooking a five-course wine dinner at Restaurant Revolution, and I'm sure it's going to be rarefied if Chef Foles is doing it. <laughs> Anthony. Yes, well, I want to take this time to brag about my uh, foundation. It is called uh, uh, Anthony Latura Foundation for the Arts mm -hmm. or NewYorkDramaticVoices.com. And you go there and you see and hear uh, some of these great 
dramatic voices that cannot, uh, uh, well, they're not ready to go uh, be hired by companies in many cases, and they have no longer can be in young artists' programs, so we afford them uh, a platform to hone their arts. I'm very proud of it. We're only two years old, and we need lots of money. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's be very straightforward, right? <laughs> Thank you. And Doug? Get to the Sydney and Walda Bestoff Sculpture Garden in City Park while the irises are in bloom and it's still cool outside. Yeah, it's one of my favorite spaces, and there's a Lynn Emery. You and know. you can visit with the Lynn Emery. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that is one of the best deals, and you get to walk around and get exercise, too. Yeah, Thank you, it's Doug. terrific. Alan. After a devastating water main break at the York Theater in January, they're holding the musical of musicals, The Musical, with a host of stars who are going to be there. Listen to this. Peggy. Among the Tony Award winners are Betty Buckley, Matthew Broderick, Andrew DeShields, Jane Krakowski, Patti Lapone, Audra McDonald, Donna Murphy, Mandy Patinkin, Cheetah Rivera, Lilius White, and Oscar and Tony Award winner Mercedes Rule, who shares a birthday with me, plus a slew of <laughs> Tony Award nominees not even mentioned. Check it out. Uh, and again, Peggy, I'll see you at the theater. Okay, thank you. And now my picks. First of all, there are numerous New Orleans Catholic churches open for the faithful to visit tomorrow, Good Friday, as part of the visiting the nine churches tradition. Go online to nolacatholic.org and scroll down to news for more information. Also info on the Stations of the Cross. Tomorrow night from 8 to 10 p.m. on WWNO 89.9 FM, announcer and producer Fred Caston pays tribute to New Orleans music legend Ellis Marcellus. Sally Marcellus passed away due to COVID last April. Caston will also have interviews with Marcellus's family members and friends. Over the next few months, we will have some special local Zoom events, We WYES, sponsored by Sandra and Russ Herman. Grape, get it? Grape performances. <laughs> Join me on April 13th for a tribute to music legend Alan Toussaint. The ticket price includes vintage performance footage courtesy of New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation from the Michael Murphy Collection. Allison Toussaint LeBeau, Toussaint's daughter, will share her memories, as will Irma Thomas, Deacon John, and WYES's Marcia Cavanaugh. Your ticket includes three bottles of wine from Spain, along with a Zoom visit from the head of the Bodegas Familia Chivari Vineyard during our program. Go to wyes.org slash events to buy a ticket. And thank you all so much. And Anthony, a quick question. What was your favorite opera role? of all time. The one that paid the most. <laughs> <laughs> what about musical comedy? Because you used to do so many of those summer lyrics, too. Uh, when I came back to do Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, Now, you also, though, we were talking about is you played model in an earlier production, yes, right? Yes, when Frank Montecchino played Tevye, I was model. Model. Okay, wonderful. Thank you and all. And I'm 3% huh? I'm Jewish. Okay. Alan, hello. Hello, <laughs> And we must say, speaking of Happy Easter, don't forget those Elmer's candies, the gold brick, and the heavenly hash. You've got to have that in your New Orleans Easter basket. Thank you all so much, and thanks for watching. Happy Easter. Rouse's is proud of the creativity and the unparalleled entertainment in New Orleans and honored to highlight it with their sponsorship of Steppin' Out on WYES. <laughs>